now that I've had other prints and we found them with toes, there's two things leaving prints out there. You just tend to have more of your dogman sightings up in the north. Just about any time you hear of Sasquatch is toward the south end. It's not something that evolved here. There's some sort of supernatural component to it. You've got peaceful Bigfoot here, and then you've got those that run with, with the dog man, and those are the ones you have to watch for. This is an area that, that is used a lot by different hikers and even some of the mountain bike people. We do get reports where there will be sightings in this immediate area, and they'll have sightings that will take place from just brief encounters where they'll see a brush with something. And it's usually a shadow, which goes with the lower of the shadow people that are seen constantly ducking in behind trees and coming in and out. And it's a lot greater in the late afternoon. Everything changes when the night falls here. It's a whole different place. Completely different place at nightfall. It's almost like flipping a switch. Everything comes to life. It's hard for most folks to understand that here, as soon as it gets dark, it's like stepping back to the early 1700s. No electronic devices. It's just pitch black like being in the deepest part of Mammoth Cave. The majority of witnesses with Bigfoot are within the campgrounds themselves where they come in at, on them at night. We have one research area and that is lot number 23 in Red Hollow and we get a lot of reports. We had a husband and wife came down and met with me just a while back and we sat down and talked with them and they were in an Airstream, one of the short versions, and um, they, they were awakened in the middle of the night. They had never heard of the story of where campsite number 23 is one of the most active areas. And so they made a little noise and the wife got a little bit scared and she shrieked or screamed and the Bigfoot walked over and began to shake the Airstream. And it scared her so bad because she really felt like that if they hadn't been anchored to their SUV, that it would have turned them over. So there are a lot of reports of Bigfoot, whether if it's just a little bit of playing with humans or uh, activity, but not really in a, of an attack. Now, there have been stories in years past, like mine, the Russian Creek incident, where people believed that the Bigfoot were working together with the dog man. But as he said earlier today, You've got peaceful Bigfoot here, and then you've got those that run with, with the dog man, and those are the ones you have to watch for. The land between the lakes is a land like no other. As if the area's unique history and geography weren't enough, the land between the lakes is said to be home to monsters. In its large and remote forests, stories of Sasquatch abound, but so too do reports of dogmen. Half-human, half-canine creatures that rule the night, not just in myth, but supposedly in reality. In modern internet lore, LBL's claim to fame is the 1982 LBL massacre, a heinous crime perpetrated by a dogman. In absence of any hard evidence that this event occurred, however, many remain skeptical of the story. I'm kind of an audio guy, so whenever we capture audio, we we throw it on a spectrogram and to be honest i have not seen any other 
frequency signatures from an animal that science does not recognize other than what we believe is a Bigfoot. I haven't had any type of man-dog encounters up here. You sit there and you listen to podcasts or look at blogs and people make it sound like that if you stop your car and get out, you, they're going to slit your throat and just have not seen that, have not had anything threatened us. Uh, we've had growls and stuff, but those on the spectrogram came back as what we believe is a Bigfoot. I am a skeptic as far as my own searching, no matter where I'm at. But if someone says that something happened to them and they believe that it was dog man, I'm, I'm not one to point a finger at somebody and saying that they don't know what they're talking about or they're lying. I think this community sometimes can be its own worst enemy. And I, I think it's important to be supportive of people if that's what they believe. Still, with all the anecdotes of Dogman terrorizing people throughout the LBL, there should be some evidence to back up these claims. So there's a, it's actually a place when you're tracking, it's called a track trap. There's a ridge, and it's actually, that's neat, as part of the ridge there's an old well. There's a lot of old houses and stuff, you know, they ran a bunch of people out to make this, the government did years ago. So there's an old well, and I've noticed over the years going to it, if the water table's high, you can see the water in it, but when the water goes down, of course it goes dry. Almost parallel to that, going down the side of a hill, there's a spot where it's just a seep and it's under the leaves. But if you don't know where it is, you're gonna slip and bust your butt probably. And of course I did that the first time. So it was wet and we just, it's a way I come up through to where we go a lot. And uh, we, it was right there. I mean, it, and it looked, and I've got good photographs of it. Uh, there was more toes than are shown on the on the actual cast, you can see in the photograph. Uh, so I, it was my first big cast, my first real clear, good print. I took some buddies out there, measured it. I've got video of the whole thing, did it right, called Charlie, asked what to do, got it. But then what was neat about it, I started going on these a few podcasts and, and that helped. The guy had me between, in, in the Bigfoot world, there's, there's Ron Moorhead, he had the Sierra tapes where he caught some chatter. Then there's Jeff Meldrum, the guy that's the foot expert. And this uh, Brian King Sharp of Sasquatch Odyssey had me, some rookie nobody from Kentucky, sandwiched in between them, I guess, for filler time. But when I heard Jeff Nelgram was going to be on there, I said, hey, man, I got this video in this cast. Let's let him check that out. I thought that'd be neat. I've got an email there. He says it's not a Sasquatch. He said the mid tarsal break is too far up and the splayed out toes, that's not what a Bigfoot would do. So uh, that kind of <laughs> led me down another path. So, well, it's, uh, when you get into the, the Bigfoot world, you get into the dogman world. You just do, you know? So that's, it's a print. It's a print. It's something left that. And now that I've had other prints and we've found them with toes, I haven't found one good enough to cast to get the good toes, but there's two things leaving prints out there, and, and you can tell, so. One of the most well-known researchers of the land between the lakes is a man named Martin Groves. Groves served in law enforcement for over 30 years in the state of Tennessee. In 1993, then Deputy Sheriff Martin Groves and a close friend had a terrifying encounter with multiple dogman creatures in the land between the lakes. After initially attempting to report the sighting to local authorities, they were ridiculed and threatened with legal action if they did not keep quiet. For decades, Groves kept silent about his encounter, but in recent years has become more outspoken about it, even writing a book about his experience in LBL. Groves's research has been collected in two volumes, the first covering his original encounter in 1993 and a second covering much of the research he's been conducting over the past few decades. 
Groves somberly points out that at least 18 people have been killed under mysterious circumstances in the LBL, their deaths labeled as unknown or killed by unknown animal. Some of these have occurred in locations very close to where Groves' initial encounter occurred. Russian Creek is an area around the Jones Creek boat ramp, an area that they've actually closed down due to a juvenile attack that occurred in November of 22. Uh, we had a juvenile hunter that was hunting with his father, and as soon as the, 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 the again, I say the word juvenile, so it's hard to get very much uh, information concerning the attack, but it, something ran through his blind knocked him down and he had some injuries. Immediately the park shut the area down and cited that the bridge was uh, unsafe to travel and this is a bridge that that takes you down to the area of the peninsula that is totally blocked off. Hellbent Holler has also found an area that was adjacent to this that was shut down back in the 1980s for the same reason there was an attack there as well. Uh, now, they are attempting to open this area back up, just the one, one area where the uh, juvenile was attacked. But this area uh, that we're speaking of, Russian Creek, that's within a mile to all this of where my original attack took place in 1993. You know, he's done a tremendous amount of work in this park and interviewing people outside the park, in the park. And that's, I don't know anybody that's spent the time he has trying to find out about attacks and occurrences here. He spent a lot of years doing that. And the only other people I know of that get out here and try to run through the woods and find these things are Helvin Holler, besides... Joe and Jesse are the Joe greatest Jesse investigators are the best that you've ever met. When it comes to boots on the ground, they're not, they're fearless. So, uh, me... Martin and Martin only have spent a lot of nights here and had some very strange things happen. We haven't been attacked by anything, but I think we were very close to being attacked last March when he went in the woods. Before that happened, he had been infrasounded, zapped, whatever you want to call it. You know, I hear it called all different type things, but he had gotten very sick. And I drove him in his vehicle down to a good ways to a um, the facility, yes. because he felt like he was going to throw up and he was very sick and had a headache and he had to lay in his truck when we come back and we started hearing the increase of these what we thought were dog men. You could actually hear them run across the shallow water behind us which made me kind of nervous because me and Martin are sitting next to a fire and of course you know, as far as weapons go, you're not supposed to carry weapons here. We try not to carry weapons except a knife or something. We usually have just edge weapons. And we try to abide by the rules of the park and by the laws, but at the same time, you got to protect yourself. And I quite frankly think if he hadn't went in the woods that night and said what he said, they would have definitely come in on us. They were close at that time. Daryl Denton is one of Martin Groves' best friends, and they've known each other for over 40 years. As a sign of their close friendship, Denton was one of the first people Groves confided in about his story. How we became super close was in 93, after he had his encounter at the LBL with uh, the dogman attack, because I have had a Bigfoot encounter in 92. And at that time, you couldn't talk to anything about a Bigfoot or a dogman. People would have thought you were crazy, especially with me, an elected official, and him as a, you know, a sheriff's department deputy. And he was a high-ranking officer. He was chief deputy, I believe, which is next to the sheriff. And I had told another friend of mine about my Bigfoot occurrence, a hunting partner of mine. And uh, he's also a friend of Martin's. And he had told Martin, hey, you know, he's seen a Bigfoot up while he was hunting. And Martin had heard that. And that's when Martin came and consoled me about his encounter. He and I would go to lunch and we would talk. And I would tell a little bit of what happened to me. And he'd tell me a little bit about how, what happened to him. And we pretty much had to live that ourselves. And unless we were around each other, then we felt a little confident 
talking about it, and that made us super close, and we've been best friends ever since. And Martin had nightmares for years over this thing, and I did too. For the first, up to probably seven years, uh, the first several months was really bad. You just don't get over it that easy. But, you know, he lived with that a long time. He held that in like 30 years, and, you know, I pretty much held it in until maybe four or five years ago before I really came out. Uh, I started a group in, two, well, I didn't start it, Michael Patterson did in 2015, I believe it was, and he and I, that were, there were only a couple, maybe two or three groups on Facebook at that time, and that really opened the door up for people like myself and Martin because you could conversate with other people who had encounters on the groups, and then I started doing, quite a, I was asked to be a guest on a lot of different podcasts and radio shows, and it kind of opened up where a lot of people were able to really tell what they had lived through. Anybody that goes through these type of encounters, it's not anything just to get over when when you don't realize that there, something like this is actually out there because we're all raised to believe that this stuff don't exist. People like you, you know, small town monsters being here to help us and tell the story makes a big difference when you have somebody this day and time, you know, compared to what we had. We had nobody to talk to. Everybody thought you were crazy, and I can't blame them. It takes a little bit to wrap your mind around it. And um, I'm more open-minded now than I've ever been. I think there's uh, a lot of things we don't know about. Nowadays, Denton and Groves search the LBL in search of evidence and experiences with Dogman or Sasquatch. You're going to look for signs. You're going to get in an area. You're going to try to find tree breaks. There again, you'd like to find a game trail close to water if you can find it. Because all these creatures are going to follow a game trail. Because they're going to ambush deer and hogs, and that's what they're going to feed on mainly. You're going to find large structures that they've made or X's in the woods, which is the one I always look for, a large X. It would be a, two large trees, maybe broken, and one may be a deadfall, and they put them together to form an X. And those are the ones I look for mainly, because I've had experiences with Bigfoot, and those types seem to be the more friendly type, the ones that make the X formations. So. That's the signs you look for for Bigfoot. You find a tree break and you find a game trail, you follow that game trail close enough and get in there deep enough, you're gonna find evidence of Bigfoot being close by, or you'll hear them. And he and I have heard them several times that we were going in. They'll make a knock on top of the hill to the left of us or throw something or a tree or even a whoop or another noise. <laughs> so they're not. I don't really think they're looking to harm you when you're walking in in the daytime. I don't know, the nighttime, everything changes here, so it'd be difficult for me to say. Now, the one we've seen, as I mentioned earlier, last March, they didn't try to harm us, and it watched us for quite a while, and there was three of us that witnessed it. And we had another gentleman with us that evening before uh, day, uh, daylight had ended, and he had seen a small one looking over a stump at us while we were actually grilling out that evening. And uh, they were just curious. They didn't try to harm us. But that was the same night we heard the dog man about 2 or 2.30 in the morning. And it was a very strange night. And I've witnessed Martin go into the woods and kind of speak to him. And it kind of changed. It got quiet in a hurry. It, it got pretty hairy in that night that we felt like we were very, uh, uh, our camp was compromised. And uh, if I feel compromised or I feel like that we're in danger, I'll go right into the woods and attempt to approach these things. I know it sounds crazy, but by the power, I'm a very religious person. And uh, I have several prayers that I use. And that night they had come in on us and they began to get violent. We had things thrown into the camp. And so I will go in and b b begin to pray and pray verbally. And as soon as I do that, for whatever reason, it's worked every time, they will disperse and leave us alone. Sounds, sounds strange. Now his way and, I, and mine, we are almost the same in everything. The way we approach the subject of Bigfoot or, 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 or dogmen, he'll carry a cell phone 
and he will take photographs or record noises and stuff. For me, and he, he stays on to me all the time about going by myself, I will not carry any battery operated device. I will go into the woods with a 12 inch kerosene lantern, no batteries, and sit. You don't go find them, they find you. That's 100% uh, sure there. Yes, and uh, I'll have more luck than most researchers will have, no matter how far they travel. They'll find you. If they're close, they'll find you. Well, some people seem to have something in them that relate to these creatures anyway, and it's not anything you ask for. I don't know how you get it, but I've had lots of encounters with Bigfoot over since 1992, my first occurrence. And Martin has the same thing with the dog man. So it kind of works well for both of us. I even have some type of thing about me that I can feel them sometimes if they're close by. And he does the same thing. So although well, we've been friends for so many years, it just so happens that we work real well together because of that reason. And yes, it, uh, it's kind of like watching each other. We know we know what's going on without speaking. Mm -hmm. And the and the funny thing is, and this is something that that campers need to understand, we will find the tracks all at the edge of the woods where these creatures will sit and be observant and they're watching the campers of this area. And that's something we're finding. You've got three really good camps uh, that has cabins and tents here in Lamb Between yeah. Lakes. And there's so many dispersed camp campers, but we've become friends with the uh, the RAs or the representatives that run these these campgrounds. Every single one of them off camera will tell you of the activity of how things come to the uh, the metal trash bins and they will find the tracks and they'll have sightings all along the edge of wherever these camps are. And I find that fascinating. These things are, are very curious creatures and they're wanting to watch the campers for whatever reason. You have to stay in here a lot of nights and days and go into a deep area, not just a campground, which we do go into places like this and stay. And you hear a lot of noises and sounds. You don't know what you're hearing. But there's a difference here when you start hearing a different howl like we heard last March. It was pretty strange. That was probably the strangest night we've had here. We know what the red wolf sounds like. And we do have the red wolf here, no matter what park official says. The red wolf exists here. And we have all kinds of coyotes. There'll be a pack of 20, 30 coyotes is a small. They'll surround everything, but we know the sounds. But once you hear the bay of what we refer to the beast between these rivers, it's a whole lot different. It, it'll make the hair stand on your head. In the modern lore of the land between the lakes, there exists a natural boundary between the Sasquatch and Dogman. This invisible yet respected boundary essentially divides the LBL into two halves, the north end inhabited by dogmen and the south inhabited by Sasquatch. So for whatever reason, uh, you just tend to have more of your dogman sightings up in the north. That's where the family would have been attacked. That's where Hotel California is. That's where uh, some decent amount of sightings have taken place. Your prominent events have taken place with dogmen up in the northern end, but just about any time you hear of Sasquatch related events is toward the south end, like where evidence of Tennessee Bigfoot often stays and gets good activity. That's in the south, that's almost directly near the south end entrance. But anything prominent with Dogman, like uh, your most well known stories, almost directly right up at the top. My personal theory is probably just like a territorial kind of thing. They don't like to get in around each other, you know. You've heard stories before floating around online that I seen a Bigfoot and a Dogman fighting each other. I don't know if that's true, but they, they don't seem to prefer being in each other's company. So that would be my personal best guess. However, this idea is not upheld by everyone who researches the LBL. I don't agree with that. It's possible, but it's like saying this lake is divided in half and you got, you got bass on one half and brim on the other. I mean, it's the same principle, you know. I don't think they're, they're divided like that, you know. 
So when we first came here, that was the exact same thing we'd heard. There were Dogman in the north, Sasquatch in the south, and then kind of this DMZ type zone in the middle where they would occasionally come into conflict at. Um, other than just hearing like just stories about that on the internet where people just discussed that, we've never gotten any reports from people like firsthand accounts of seeing like Dogman Bigfoot fights or anything like that. Instead, what we've gotten are stories like Martin Groves. Where it of, seems like they're working in tandem. Yeah, working in tandem or at least in proximity with like no problems between the two of them. Um, I think that that Dogman Bigfoot War was just kind of a sexy story that just kind of yeah. just kind of took life of its own on the internet. And we found evidence of Sasquatch in the north. We yeah. found, uh, actually this week when we came in, we found a print. It was a pretty um, noticeable, mm -hmm. pretty just sizable print that we, we filmed on our first day up here. And it was close to the LBL massacre site from uh, 1982. We found what looked like a track line in the snow up here one winter in that cemetery that's right above the 82. And it looked like larger footprints. Uh, there'd been no melting. Actually, the temperature was dropping. The snow was still coming down. And I looked at it because, you know, sometimes regular footprints as the snow melts will appear larger than they originally were. Um, these had been fairly fresh at that point. A long stride length between them. The, the feet were really noticeable. And I'm going, all right, well, this doesn't look like what you would anticipate a dog man footprint to look like. This looks like a stereotypical large Bigfoot print. And it was leading out of the cemetery and into the woods. Yeah. And then Martin Grove's encounter happened more towards the south end, where supposedly there's only Sasquatch down there. Um, and like I said, so everybody that we've ever had a sighting actually reported to us where they're giving us first person information. Um, they've never gone, hey, I stumbled upon a dog man Bigfoot fight, you know, in the middle of the forest or anything. So. Uh, at least as far as what we've been able to uncover, that was just kind of an internet invention at that point, so. You will hear some of the researchers that in years past that they will claim that Bigfoot are in one area and dogmen are in the other. That is simply not true. We have Bigfoot sightings all over the park as well as dogmen. So we can now rest and throw away the old ideas of Bigfoot is only in the south and Dogman is in the north. I think Joe and Jesse Doyle have said it best. They do not have a map or a sector. There is no mapping or state line for the Bigfoot or Dogman. They are simply all over the park. And I might add that there are so many sightings outside the park as we get up into Grand Rapids. Grand Rivers and the Cadiz area. They're, they're all over. They work hand in hand in tandem from my sighting in 93, but uh, even more and a greater sighting actually took place what we found in DeBumbers Bay. And DeBumbers Bay is an area where there have been 11 people that have died by animal attacks since 1965, two years before the park. And what he and I found in October of last year, we found two separate Bigfoot tracks that were accompanied with dog man together and they had killed a very large deer in Demumbers Bay. We followed the tracks, the tracks indicated the Bigfoot and the, and the dog men converged together and they killed the deer and then packed the deer out. And we followed the tracks from Demumbers Bay and this is the area that is high in activity and a history of attacks upon humans. And these tracks indicated to us that they came into Demumbers Bay, exited and went deep into the woods. I, th I think the whole area has got occupied by both of them. I like Mark and I do agree with that. Although I haven't had a, a large amount of Bigfoot sightings here, I know they're here. We have been walking and we could hear them. And... Further complicating the world of the unusual is the presence of a potential third creature known as the Gugwe. The word Gugwe translates as face eater and is often attributed to the Mi'kmaq, a First Nations people indigenous to Nova Scotia. Thought to be a type of Sasquatch, the Gugwe is known for having a more prognathic face like a baboon, coupled with a more aggressive temperament compared to a normal Sasquatch. 
The descriptions of these gagwe are very similar to reports of Dogman, making the topic a dubious gray area that is far from any true conclusion. Even still, many people, including Martin Groves, believe that they may have seen a gugway. The two Bigfoot that were actually at the camp where he and his partner were attacked by the, tried to be attacked by the dog man, which made him flee. You know, it's very possible because he wasn't aware of them and I wasn't either. Uh, you know, it could have very well been a gugway because they're very similar to a Bigfoot, but they have a small snout in their face and it's hard to say that it was, but it's hard to say that it wasn't. There was two of them together. I, I agree with him completely because when we see the typical drawings and images, the drawing that Sibylla Irwin did for me, you will see that it was not the same style of Bigfoot. And I say it comically, the Harry and the Henderson type. This, this thing, these two creatures were very violent. Their faces were, were contorted and just very angry and their teeth were different and their facial, everything was different compared to what we are, the stereotypical Bigfoot that we see or hear of. And uh, when you match them up with drawings, they do look more like a gugway. The difference that I see mainly is that the, the kinder, more softer Bigfoot that we've had contact with, and especially those that are building the structures that you described, they look a whole lot different than the Gugway, and the Gugway are the violent, very, you, you'll know the difference when you see the two. The Gugway are very violent, uh, are prone to attack, and their facial features and their teeth are so much different. And they do have somewhat of a, a nose or snout to them compared to uh, uh, the Harry and Henderson type. I've never so. personally seen a Gugway, I've only heard of them, but I have been told they are in this area, in the. I've been told by certain people, if they're telling them the truth, that they're, in the, they're over closer to the east end of the, of the park. I don't know how many of them are here or, or what, but they, they are normally loners too. That's what makes his situation a little different. So that's why I don't say I'm 100% sure it was a good way. I think it probably was, but it was also a smaller one with that one. It mm -hmm. could have been a juvenile with that one. I've never heard any Gugway sightings down here where people referred to it. Now, there have been some very aggressive Sasquatch encounters down here. And what's weird is, is because you have Dogman and Sasquatch kind of like supposedly in close proximity here, um, when those aggressive attacks happen, it's kind of hard sometimes to pin down maybe exactly what happened with it. Uh, some of the bow hunters that have gone missing or found dead down here, people assume it's Dogman. You know, just because you, traditionally dogmen are more aggressive. You know, those are more aggressive, violent encounters. But it's there's no survivor to tell you what happened exactly. You or know, exactly what did it. Could have been an aggressive Sasquatch. Uh, the two things that Martin Groves saw were not friendly. He got a very a very intense feeling of like aggression and dread off of them at that point. And he thought that they were working kind of in tandem with the, the creatures that attacked him and his hunting partner. So, um, so I've never really heard the word Gugway used down here. But, you know, we haven't really heard Dogman used a lot by a lot of the witnesses that are down here. Unless you're kind of involved in the cryptid community, you've never heard of a Dogman before. We you get would approximate it to a werewolf. Yeah, we get people that are saying werewolves. We got, I got attacked by a werewolf. You're gonna think I'm crazy, but we saw a werewolf feeding on a deer on the side of the trace, or just a monster, a beast, something like that. Amidst the discourse of the existence of Sasquatch and the truth of the Gugway, firmly sits a continual debate in the cryptid and paranormal community. Is the Dogman a flesh and blood creature or is it paranormal? Oh, it's definitely physical. I mean, it leaves impressions on the environment. Uh, people have physical interactions with it. It feeds. It feeds. So. I'm of the opinion that it's a physical creature, but there is a supernatural element to it. Um, I don't know why, I don't know how, but it, it interacts with the environment completely different than just a natural animal. It's not something that evolved here and is just a, a wolf that figured out how to walk on two legs. There's some sort of supernatural component to it. Um, there are instances of it communicating telepathically or sort of in a more primal way mm -hmm. that it, 
could kill you at any time, that it has some sort of omnipotence to it, that it knows everything, it knows all about you and could just destroy you at any moment if it chooses to. But I think it's something that is here physically, but not here physically all the time. Yeah, like it can maybe pass in and out of our reality or dimension into another. Yeah, and it's weird because I don't think those two are mutually exclusive. I think that uh, Jesse's right that it's not here all the time. It's coming from somewhere else. It's here for a while. And maybe while it's here, it does normal flesh and blood things. It feeds it. You know, like just said, leaves it in her, you know, marks on the environment. Uh, we get a lot of reports of it eating roadkill or eating deer on the side of the road that presumably might have been hit by cars. So obviously there's a need for sustenance. There's a need for, you know, nutrition, but then it doesn't seem to have a permanent presence here. Uh, what's weird about, even in the LBL that has a lot of like dogman sightings, if it was a permanent creature here, it seems like there'd be a lot more. And it seems like you would, you'd find bodies. Where are the bodies at? You know, they've got to die eventually. We get reports of these things just taking gunfire with no, you know. No effect. No effect whatsoever. So maybe they have some sort of supernatural strength or ability to absorb gunfire. Yeah, and it's weird because with Sasquatch, you know, it's kind of a mixture. It's kind of a blend, you know, like a regular roadside crossing. Hey, I saw it eating berries, you know, and then you have the stranger ones where, you know, hey, it cloaked, it teleported, it mind speak. Usually with Dogman, there's a few stories of it just acting like a normal animal, but the vast majority of them seem to have some sort of like supernatural element to it. So yeah, I just, I'm with Jesse. I think it's a physical creature. I just think that it's from somewhere else. And if you ask me like where else, I don't know. People talk about the cave systems around here. It doesn't seem like it's a normal subterranean creature. That doesn't make sense. But it just seems like it comes in and out of like our reality and does what it wants to do for a little while and then disappears. And that's gotta be intelligently controlled. Cause I always go, you don't hear about one appearing in like Grand Rivers is the city just north of the massacre site, the little town. You don't hear of one just appearing in the middle of the town square at like 2 p.m. on a Friday, you know? It's coming and going. Selectively. Selectively, you know, where it may occasionally be seen by a few people. And, you know, there's a lot of rumors up in this area about missing people. When the tornadoes hit up through here, there were a lot of people displaced from their homes that had nowhere else to go to. So we had several people reach out to us just going, hey, you guys need to be careful because there's, there are people that are camping in here because they have nowhere else to go to. They're going missing at this point. And some of the people were warning us that it was a sketchy human element. There was some sort of criminal activity taking place causing these people to go missing. Other people were attributing it to the creatures that supposedly live on this peninsula. And we took that under advisement. We came here and we started finding abandoned tents that had been ripped up. So that kind of reinforced what those people had been telling us. So it's just another example of you hear these stories and people give you these accounts and they talk about these very specific things. Mm -hmm. And then we come in and we find evidence of those things mm -hmm. in it's terms important. of the tunnels, in terms of the tents. Um, and that just seems like it keeps happening with the LBL. People will tell us these stories and we get out into the woods and all of a sudden we're starting to find evidence that these are not just stories, that this stuff is real. As the old saying goes, dead men tell no tales. And who knows what stories the missing or deceased people could tell us about the creatures that live in the LBL. What truths did they discover that are now lost to time? One of the most common features of the LBL are cemeteries, many belonging to some of the original pioneers of the region and others that predate those. There are centuries worth of displaced people who lived hard lives that are now resting in the LBL. Many believe that their angst has seeped into the ground, creating an atmosphere of dread throughout the LBL. And a few believe that these creatures might be manifesting in these areas. A lot of sightings are reported of Dogman and Bigfoot in cemetery areas. They seem to be around cemetery areas for some reason. I don't know the reason behind that, but that seems to be a rare, a, a regular occurrence that they like to hang around cemeteries. And there's over 200 cemeteries in this park. And there's, of course, some underwater too. And I don't know the exact location of those, but it's said when the water's low, you can see the top of some of them, but. Yes. 
why they attract the cemeteries, I really don't understand that myself, but I hear that same type thing all across the country. People will say they'll see a dog man or a Bigfoot while they're at a cemetery, so. The common denominator that we have that it, what he has brought up is there are countless numbers of witnesses here in the land between the lakes region that they still visit these cemeteries and place flowers and, and honor their, you know, their grandparents and parents and siblings. And they will go by and one of the things they, a lot of folks do here is clean the stones and the marble in the spring. And with that comes all kinds of sightings that have taken place where they see Bigfoot and Dogman. And this goes in hand in hand in conjunction with the theory that Ron Moorhead has, and it's a very sound theory, that these things come and go from the trees. These things come and go from the cemetery and disappear into trees, older, older growth generated trees. And uh, it's Pretty strange to hear people that have never spoken to one another, they've never met, will have almost the same uh, type of description. Hey, we saw two dog men, they walked at the edge of the cemetery, watched us, and disappeared into the trees. Now, this is one of the oldest cemeteries there is up on this edge of, the, of where we're located at. We've had uh, at least three, possibly four that I, I can recall of witnesses who have said they've come up here and it's mainly due to the fact it is a Catholic cemetery and they were Catholic and they like to come through and just pick some weeds out and clean the place up some. They had reported that in the late, late evening is when they have had sightings that these, what they call the shadow people, which are the dog men, will come out of the edge of the woods and will be observant and they can see them from 50, maybe 50, 70 feet, something of that, that. And it always spooks the people and runs them out of here. We have a lady that was, she actually had a dog man in the edge of the cemetery and then one that jumped out of a huge cedar tree. We have the same reoccurrence at the 1982 uh, site where four people were killed that is called Mount Pleasant Cemetery in which a husband and wife was cleaning the cemetery stones. They, they cleaned every stone within the cemetery they would take all day. And two dog men were seen up in the trees and they jumped down on them and they of course become so frightened and they fled the cemetery. They explained to me they will never go back. You, you can imagine how eerie this place would be at night. Like Martin said, some of these stones are really old. There's a lot of old cemeteries here. I was raised Catholic myself, so I can understand, but uh, it seems to be more predominant in the Catholic cemeteries. For what reason, I, I have no clue. One of the strange common factors is they seem to walk the edges rather than coming into, I have reports, that different cemeteries that are not Catholic, they will actually come and walk through the cemetery. And then I've got, you know, cause I keep all these little factors written down and all these different characteristics. And one of the characteristics I find very strange that in a Catholic cemetery, the dog men are never seen inside the cemetery, but at the edges. And I, I don't have an answer for that. One of the things that we do a lot is we mark and we not only find in Confederate, we look for Union graves too that are unattended and we try to clean them and take care of them because there are many. And I, and I truly believe that is a, a factor within the peninsula that there are so many Confederate and Union soldiers buried here. And the conflict of Fort Defiance and Fort Donelson that is so close this entire north-south trail was used by both Union and Confederate armies to go to and from Kentucky. They'd go from here to Louisville 
and to, to I mean Clarksville was a strong point and you know until uh, Fort Donaldson fell that was a very strong fort at one time and the battle that took place there I had three family members captured at Fort Donaldson and taken to the I, I won't even say the words but the terrible prisons of Fort Butler and uh, up in as well as the one in Chicago and uh, they were really bad places to be sent and uh, but when Fort Donaldson fell and there was so many soldiers killed there was so many that their graves are unknown and unmarked all through the peninsula. The folklore on it, it's a little, it's a little muddied. You see some people talk about Indian legends of like shape-shifting shamans through here that took like a wolf form. You don't really have a native tradition like you do out west with like skinwalkers and whatnot, but there are legends about it. And again, when the first Europeans came through here, a lot of Kentucky and West Virginia, you know, Native American tribes considered that the dark and bloody ground. They would go in to hunt, but then they would try not to really settle or spend a lot of time in here. But you get back at least with like the first European like settlers that came through here. There's been stories of stuff stretching back like generations. There's a little bit of debate because French fur trappers came through here and they, people will go, well, they brought their legends of like Loup Garou with them. And then other people went, no, it's just that they put a name to what they were experiencing here. We talked earlier about the people being displaced and taken off their land. And some people had the theory that maybe some of these families somehow put a curse or they themselves, there was a rumor of like a werewolf family living around here. Um, you get into something like that and it's just one of those stories that kind of bounces around. I've never had somebody give us a first person account going, hey, I saw a guy transform into a wolf here. Those stories kind of are bandied about, but it's always like second, third, fourth hand information, something that somebody heard. So those stories are definitely around here. Uh, it's just not as, they're not as prevalent and we haven't found anything to back those up at that point. And we've discussed before that you know, th there's so much anger and there's so much resentment and nothing, you know, nothing ever came of this. Part of that might be because of the predation that's going on here by these things. And he mentioned the, the sort of the conjuring of this thing, that maybe there was so much anger that somebody with a little ability and a little know-how could have brought these things over from another dimension, another another side of the veil, brought it over as an act of revenge against the TVA, against the authorities that took everything from these people. And Kentucky's weird. You get into any state or region, everybody's got their local boogeymen, their local like, you know, their, their local cryptid basically. Down where we're at, it's the scape or, you know, lizard bin. You get through Kentucky, it's like every little section of Kentucky has a werewolf legend, you know, the Wadi werewolf, the gateway werewolf, Barilla, which was supposedly a mixture of a bear and a gorilla that looked very wolf-like. So Kentucky, it seemed like already just was primed for this sort of activity. And then the LBL came into existence and it seemed like it magnified what was there already by like a factor of 10. And it's just weird because when you look through Kentucky as a whole, we were mapping for a while strange animal attacks, both attacks on people by strange animals or attacks on animals where they didn't know what the predator was. There's a ton of them through Kentucky. And if they're all just due to like stray dogs, I mean. It's mostly attributed to feral dogs, packs of feral dogs, but it's. It, it goes beyond It doesn't that. add up. There's I a mean, lot of details when it comes to some of these cases. It just doesn't add up. We're from rural South Carolina and there are packs of feral dogs that are just let loose running there all the time. People do occasionally get attacked, that happens, but it doesn't happen anywhere near with the frequency that it seems to happen in Kentucky. And it's weird because Jesse's got a theory that if you look at it, if there is a supernatural kind of element to it, when you look at, especially like Western European folklore, the supernatural, it's kind of held at bay with iron, okay, cold iron. Like this actually, was the center of the iron ore industry for this region uh, in the mid 1800s for a while, because you have the Cumberland River over here, they would ship tobacco, cotton, and the iron ore down the river. And the LBL is very, very, was very rich in iron. And they mined the land and took a lot of the iron out of the land. There were eight furnaces around here. We're actually standing just right across from where a furnace was. It's under the water now, but there was empire furnace down here. There were eight furnaces across 
the, the land between the rivers and they would, you know, they would smelt the iron and take it out of the land. So I think if you look at European folklore, iron was used to protect against the Fae, um, witches, uh, any kind of evil, you can kind of keep it at bay with iron. They've taken every bit of that or most of it out of the land here and just shipped it off somewhere. So it's like this whole place has been left completely without protection from whatever supernatural evil, evil forces are out there. When we started putting our LBL like videos out, that's when we really started getting contacted by a lot of people in this area. And Jesse mentioned earlier the bitterness that's still here to this day from people being taken off their land. But people would go, you know, hey, you know, my, my, on my mother's side of my family, we own 20 acres in the LBL and our family used to have livestock go missing. You know, we were told to come in at dark and it went kind of beyond those like usual fairy tales that are kind of used to keep the kids from straying too far, that even the adults would kind of come in after dark at this point. You get into any area, any of these window areas that have like a lot of high strangeness, you've got people that have had personal encounters and believe, and then people that have just never had anything happen to them. We always talk about how Skinwalker Ranch, you know, there are probably people that live within a two mile radius that go, I've never had anything weird happen to me, it's all just BS. Through here, we have a higher percentage of people that contact us saying, yeah, I have had experiences there. My family's had experiences there. My grandmother used to tell me these stories and continued to tell me them sto the stories into adulthood, you know, claiming that these things were real. So there's been, there's been activity here. This was pretty sparsely populated though. And a lot of these areas didn't have electricity until these dams were built. Um, so they got electricity and they kind of got modernized much later than like other parts of America. So those stories just didn't travel that much. Um, there wasn't as much like tourism that took place here. Even now there's not a lot of tourism with the LBL, not what you would expect. But those stories were there, they just didn't travel or just didn't get documented as much as like other parts of the country where there was more of a flow of information in and out. I was with a guy on a, on a night expedition. We were on the road. Uh, it sounded more like garbled speaking than growling or anything, but we were both uncomfortable enough to go on back because we were probably half a mile away from the group in the camp. But I took my son back to this spot. And there's an old cemetery there. And what was neat about it is I'd been to actually the cemetery before. There's a, there's a guy here, his last name's Bannister. I forget his, I've actually got a picture in there of his tombstone. It says murdered on the tombstone, and the tombstone has been cracked and put back together. And evidently this guy, you can, it's, I googled it to find out, got shot through a window in the back of the head while he was eating in Land Between the Lakes. I think it was in the 30s or 40s. When I was there the first time, I just felt like there was something over there. I was with Charlie, and, and that's how we discovered the tombstone. And I even thought I saw a shadow or something, so we went looking around. So I wanted to take my son back because he's, Ghost is a whole nother avenue, but I had an experience in Waverly Hills years ago when I was a skeptic that turned me into a believer in that side of the world too. So we've, and I took my son, my son's been into that. So I knew he would like it. We're in the cemetery and uh, you can hear something walking. It's, it's night, it's dark and the truck's right there. So we were no more than a hundred feet from the truck, but we could hear something uh, walking, thought maybe it's a Bigfoot. Again, they usually observe you. I don't think they approach people a lot unless they're really angry or you're disrupting their hunting or there's some issue. Um, I think they watch and they observe. But uh, we looked around, we tried to get some K2 stuff and some responses and, and then we hear walking over here. Pretty close, there's a fence around the cemetery. So I said, hey man, let's just go back to the truck. We had started a little fire and uh, we, we got back to the truck and. Uh, it's windy night, wind was coming over here. And then we hear walking over here on, on the side of the road. I'm like, man, what do you want to do? And, and we had already made the decision, we're just going to get out of there. And uh, then right on, back on this side, we hear it was a growl. It was a growl. N not like I had heard, nothing like I've heard on the, on the Sasquatch shows. It, it was different. It was a growl. And uh, so we got in the truck and left. So, and of course, I've heard all the stories, the, the stories here, and I don't know if they're, uh, they're validated or not, but even, it's weird that everybody's kind of, I think, 
coming to the realization that maybe Sasquatch is real, but then they're kind of like the dog man still have to be mythical. But almost everyone I've spoken with on these podcasts, some of them retired police officers. I mean, the credible people have, even a good friend of mine broke down and said, I saw one one night in Nashville on the side of the road eating some roadkill. So I, I, I'm not going to not believe them. You know, I'm, I'm always that guy, well, I've got to see it and it's got to happen to me. Well, I was that way about ghosts and now I'm, <laughs> I know that's real. I was that way about Bigfoot. Uh, I'm not going to go out and try to track down a dog man. Just, I'm going to take people's word for this one. It is tempting to lump dog man into bedtime stories of monsters that live under the bed or in the closet. But the truth of the matter is that people are seeing them. And according to some, people are being killed by them. What these creatures are is unknown. And it is unlikely that the truth will ever be fully discovered. But one thing is certain, that wherever there are people, there are monsters living in the periphery, showing themselves only to a few before hiding back in the space between spaces to continue to haunt their victims in their dreams and to survive through the collective belief in them. So be wary, those of you who peer into the darkness in search of these things, for something might just peer back.